Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, I bear witness that there is no God but He, the One, the Incomparable, the Mighty, the Wise. We thank Him so much for the privilege of coming to birth in a book of truth, the universe created by him for the benefit of every soul that walks or comes to birth on this planet. There's so much for us to learn. It is a shame that so many of us leave the earth not having learned what the Creator intended for us to learn. I thank Allah, the Most High, for His intervention in our affairs and really in the affairs of the whole human family, but starting with us. That he would not send a prophet, he would come himself. Come out of his hiding place to make himself known to us and through us to the entire planet. Why, why wasn't God known? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught us that since the deportation of moon, the splitting of the moon from this part that is called Earth, said 66 trillion years ago there was only the planet moon but one of our great scientists and we have so many among the original people that created all of this wonder that you see wasn't made by a spook. Wasn't made by a spirit. It was a human being who is all wise, omnipresent, and does as he pleases. But he's a human being. How could you and I be made in the image and likeness of God and we are humans with brain capacity to master what God has created for us to master? We are so far from the way we once were in terms of the power that we exercised before coming on a westerly course into what is called the United States of America. You were a different kind of people. But the God came 
Because it's time. People have worshipped some of everything for God. That means they know someone was responsible for all of this. They called him by many names and they named him by many things. And they worshiped many things thinking they were worshiping God. But he came. And he chose America to make himself known. He chose America because the wicked rulers of America and this current world placed us in a condition that only God could solve. In his coming, he helped raise America to be the greatest power on earth. That America could threaten the human family that they had enough nuclear weapons that they could kill the entire planet of human beings several times over. That's a powerful man. Would you say that? He's a human being or a reasonable facsimile. He's human in that he is an imitation of the real. He's human in that he is made in the image and likeness of the original man who is the black man of Asia, the original people of our planet. If we were not here, there would not be any brown, any red, any yellow, and certainly no whites. But because we are here, he has always been among us. He chose the best part of the planet for us. Or we could say, when the moon was split from the earth, it was like a new earth. So the original people searched the earth for the best part. And we chose the holy city of Mecca in Arabia and that area of the world, the most fertile, minerally rich part of the earth. We chose it as the home of the original people. A spiritual home. But when he came to America, he saw that America had undone, unraveled, broke apart the original people of the earth. So that presented him with a problem. How do the people recognize God? Well, how do you recognize an electrician if all the lights are out? Man comes and does something that only an electrician can do. 
and you say, oh, the electrician is here. How do you know all the lights are on? Well, you know, God respects the white man because he permitted him. Notice the words I used. He permitted him, gave him form and expression, and gave him a limited time in our infinity of time to rule for 6,000 years. But in that 6,000 years, this man has worked. And nine-tenths of our planet is under his rule. Now, God comes. What did you come for? Well, I intend to sit the uh, imposter down. And establish my own king on a throne. And I intend to make a new heaven and a new earth so that all of you that live will know that I'm present. And then I'm going to allow you to see me as I am. It's God talking. Will he be in this form? What other form? All intelligence is not confined to this form, but the supreme intelligence on our planet is found in this form. And Allah said in the Quran that he gave us the best form. So this body is almost magical if you let it be itself it will heal itself it is a magnificent vessel in which the spirit of God can reside But Satan has so corrupted the spirit till last Sunday I had to say that the prophets were right when they said America has become a habitation of devils. Well, uh, you might say, well, I live here. Yeah, we know. And everywhere you go, you raise hell. Let's, let's talk about it. Because he made us into himself. So little black devils hanging out with the white devils. But the brown ones are devils, the red ones are devils, the yellow ones are devils. Because you all have been made by Satan to rebel against the law of righteousness. So look at what God said he was coming to do. He's coming and he's going to set the big bad wolf down. I mean, you mean he's coming? And this man got all this power. He got all this weaponry. And God, in human form, is going to sit him down. He's going to sit him down. 
but he's such a weak foe. He's not personally going to do it because this, this would not give the world any credit for the Lord of creation to bother himself with this Johnny come lately to his planet. So here's the plan. Here's the plan. Now, God allowed us to come into his hands. Have you ever thought, you know, about God allowing the enemy to do this to us? He couldn't have done it unless God gave him permission. So if God gave him permission to rough us up like this, beat us down like this, turn us inside out like this, why did you do that, God? He said, uh, just be calm. Uh, you'll understand it better by and by. Now here's how wise the God is to show you his power. He comes. He has three hats on. One hat is his own, and he don't show that. But he got hats for two men. And he's going to use two of the people that the enemy destroyed. Two Negroes. Two that were suffering on the plantation under white rule. They're whooping the hell out of us, not knowing that one day God would make the bottom rail come to the top. God would make the last become first. And God would take the tail and make it the head. That's why he came north to North America by himself. They didn't need no help. He set the angels down. Y'all, 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 cool, cool out. I got this. The mighty God talking. I, I, I got this. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, God sent prophets into the world. Some they beat, some they killed, some they imprisoned. But they were prophets warning the rulers is the day coming that you're going to have to reap what you have sown. Now, white folk, when they doing us evil, they already knew something about our future. Some of you are masons, uh, shriners, studying the secret wisdom of God in your lodges. But your lodge is a little different from the white folks' lodge. They allow you to have what they were given by Muhammad, the prophet. 
made them study from 35 to 50 years before they can call themselves a Muslim shriner or a Muslim son. And some of you don't even want to be a Muslim, though that's what you are. I don't care what you call yourself. You can call yourself anything as you have done. And as the white man had done, he called you nigger, he called you negro, he called you coon, he called you shine, he called you all kind of names. But your real name is God. Yeah, the Bible tells you there are lords many, gods many, but Allah is the one, the mighty, the supreme. So they got all these gods in America and turned us out. So anything that the white man is and is about and permits, he led us into it. You know how you do when you have a hit record? Only the white man can help you make a hit now. Some of you have done it from your, um, from your trunk. You made a little money too. Let's show you how tough you are. <laughs> You take nothing and make something out of it, like what God does all the time. <clears throat> so God says, yeah, I, I, I'm going to take the bottom rail, bring it to the top. I'm going to find my sheep. that is lost. I'm going to find him. I'm going to bring him again and settle him on the mountains of Israel. Now that brings up something. What, what, what is this Israel business? Jacob was a pretty tough fellow in the Bible. He wrestled with the angel. And he won. So God knew he was going to win because he was going to permit him. You know how you know the cards so well, you play it and then you let your son beat you in checkers or beat you in chess. And, and when he gets a little chesty, you know, you, you have to show him. Uh, Daddy, that is the winner, baby. Have fun while you can. So the white man had us all bamboozled. Can you see yourself in the old movies? Yasa, Yasa boss. Yasa. Hey, boy, boy, come here. Yeah, Yasa boss. Boy, our people played the role, man. Our poor women, Lord have mercy. He had a field day with you. Went in and out of you like foxes go in and out of the holes that they make. Holes, holes. <laughs> and we got children like this. Children like this beautiful black sister down here. Children with hair so nappy. Ooh. 
looked like dried raisins, you know. <laughs> then you got some curly-headed ones, and even little straight-haired ones. So he made us all up into himself. And since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that God said he's the real devil. Now wait a minute if I can. Yeah, the only reason you in hell is because you with the devil. The devil is the master of hell and uh, you didn't know it maybe, and some of you do, that you one of the devil's helpers and soldiers. Not me. I'm a disciple of Jesus the Christ. So you say. So you think. The master deceiver has made us think that we are followers of Jesus Christ. It gets worse than that. The master deceiver makes us think we're followers of Moses and the Israelite prophets. We are the real Jews. But to put the icing on the cake, Satan took over Mecca. He made Jewish devils, Muslim devils, Christian devils, Hindu devils, Buddhist devils. Look at look at look at the world. Don't tell me you're righteous. The world is in hell because Satan has become your master. So God shows up. He comes without observation, like a thief in the night. <laughs> How could he come without observation? There's an old saying, prepare me a body that I may go down. Well, a body was prepared. that looked like him, but was not him. He had a white mother from the Caucasus mountain and a jet black father. He was a master when he came here. He came in, as Isaiah the prophet said, with dyed garments on. See? That's what this is, is it? Most of the holy people in the East, they don't wear dyed garments. They, they wear white. But he came with dyed garments on. Without observation. He came in and out of America for 20 years. From 1910. Visiting white people, visiting president, visiting. Yeah. He got to know white people pretty well. Let me tell you something. You've been living with them. Not with, under. The big difference between with and under. Any woman that lives with a man knows the man. 
we lived under him. And some of us never got up into high places. But you're up there today. It's real talk. No black man becomes great in America without the help of the Jewish people. You don't become wealthy in America without the help of white people, Jewish people. They've helped you up and you can't deny it. That's why you're so angry with Farrakhan. I wonder what's wrong with Farrakhan. Oh, we talking about the, the Jewish people. Like I'm some sick man. No. Some of you think like that because you don't know the assignment that God gave to the two men that were qualifying for their hats. Now, the Bible tells you many are called, but only a few are chosen. But it seemed like Elijah Muhammad had a class full of giants. Because you study under him any short amount of time. To this world, they call you a heavyweight. So Brother Malcolm, as I said over the weekend, studied 12 years with Elijah Muhammad and his place in the class was aborted. He was aborted. I don't know whether you've ever seen an abortion. It's not a pretty sight. Because an abortion is when you don't let a thing grow to term. Some force, some disease interferes. And the growing living thing dies and it never came to full term. Malcolm never reached his potential fully. He only went to the eighth grade of school. But under Elijah Muhammad, he beat up college professors. I was with him at Harvard, and they brought out a champion Negro. You know how they do. <laughs> and they sick their champion on Brother Malcolm, and he ate him up for lunch and spit the bones out for some other hungry people to eat. Frighten white people. What are we going to do about Malcolm X? Did you see the movie uh, Who Killed Malcolm? How many of you saw it? Raise your hands. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, go, go see it. Interesting study. Brother Malcolm, when you watch him teach, the ears of black people, I'm talking about the common black man, was open for Malcolm. More so than Dr. King, more so than any of the civil rights leaders, because black people were angry and fed up with white folk. So they needed somebody to wake them up and 
Malcolm's voice was the voice of Elijah. And something happened. You know, when I was a young Muslim, listen to this. I gave up my show business and got a job in the garment section of Boston, Massachusetts. And I was a little fella. And the Jewish person who owned the business, I was just eating one meal a day. So one day she came to me and said, uh, Louis, uh, are you trying to develop a hernia from picking up these bolts of cloth so that you can sue us? See, a devil is always looking for somebody that's going to do some harm to them. And, and this was a strange Negro because I didn't eat all day. And there was a Jewish man that used to cut the fabric on the table after I brought the big roll of, of fabric. One day, there was a black man that they called Snow. You know how they do. See, the beautiful singers back in those days, a quartet, one of the most famous was named by white folks called the Ink Spots. Yeah, man. This cat, he keeps laying stuff on us, you know. So while I was picking up the bolts of cloth, my Jewish co-worker had a conversation with me. And he said, you know, you're very smart. Listen, you could be the leader. I'm just in the nation a few days. And this man is telling me that I could be the leader because I seem so smart. And that's a, that's the way the devil creeps up on your ego and makes us think we are more than what we are and then we try to show out and get busted. So when he dropped that on me, I said, sir, I said, when you and your people were in the hills and cave sides of Europe, when you talk like that, they know you know something. I said, which one of you caveys could be the leader over Moses in your condition? That was the end of it. The man knew. He was meeting a little, a little master that he could not master. Now you think about that. I'm just coming into class. The IRS came. We want you to come downtown. Sure. He said, uh, 
We haven't seen any report on your income. I said, oh, I don't have any income. Now, ain't nobody teaching me. This is just me in the way God made me. Uh, look, uh, no, I, I don't have any income. Income is money given for service rendered. I said, my job is making the blind see. Making the deaf hear, the dumb speak, and raising my dead black brothers to life. You ain't got enough money to pay me for that. Listen, listen. So God promised me a reward. So if you're still around, when I get my reward, Maybe you can try to tax that. Get out! That's the wisdom of my teacher! And they trying to abort me from such a class as that. Y'all all right? I'm trying to show you what kind of classroom Malcolm and Muhammad Ali and all of us were in. I was just a little fella in the class. And the white man was trying to make me rebel against my teacher. So when Brother Malcolm didn't follow the instructions of the teacher who told him, no, 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 president is dead, don't make any statement about it. Now, a Negro that don't have a teacher, you would laugh at Kennedy's assassination because you don't see the bigger picture. Malcolm knew the bigger picture, but he was blinded by his own feelings that he could handle it. Well, it was a case of the chickens coming home to roost. And I'm never sad when chickens come home to roost. I'm in fact, I'm glad. Next day, same night, Malcolm X, the heir apparent of Elijah Muhammad and the black Muslims, was joking and laughing at the assassination of our president. Now, I'm, I'm in Boston, man. The Irish Catholics run the town. You, you a wise man? Do you go in the face of the enemy and the messenger told you, no, 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 don't, don't say anything. Gone. My brother, his tenure in the class was interrupted and he decided he didn't like the punishment that his teacher gave him. And he left the class. See, when you leave the classroom of God, then you flunk life's lesson. then death follows. Teacher, brother, that's right. 
Muhammad Ali shot white people. And you loved him because he had the strength and the courage to challenge white people. You know that. I am the greatest of all time. With his handsome, braggadocious self. Then he would tell them what round they were going to fall on and knock them out in that round. See, only God could speak like that. Well, I'm going to take you down in two. And when the dude goes down in two, he said, damn, this man knew what he was going to put on me. And See, Malcolm and, Ma and, and, and Muhammad, we were practicing gods. I mean, just, just think about practicing wisdom and making the enemy run away from you. Just, we practice it. Some lessons that we learn in our class. All right, let me get to the point here. God was going to use some Negroes to bring the enemy down. One from among us, he's going to make him so powerful. I want you to listen to me. That he would be able to control the weather. See, God does that all by himself. But he's going to take a Negro and fix it. You see, man, come on, stop lying like that. See, that's how little you think of your potential. Every day in your life, when you do wrong, you create storms in your life. You can't handle the storm that you created. All of this is a part of God's preparation of those that he would use to raise us up and bring the enemy to a naught. Now, for the last near 40 years, I have been labeled as an anti-Semite. And most of you have heard that name applied to me and to us. They called me in, invited me to dinner. And I invited them to dinner. Top Jewish scholars came and sat at my table, my father's table, but I'm living in the house. They're sitting at my table and they're telling me, Farrakhan, you do not try to teach us. Did you hear what I said? Yes, sir. I'll give you his name. Rabbi Shalman, who was the dean of all of the rabbis in Chicago. Say, you don't lecture us. That's for me to do. In other words, how dare you, nigga. I mean, underneath, that's what it's all about. How dare you think that you can criticize and correct us? It's 
So I looked at the rabbi. I said, Rabbi, there was a rich man in the Bible. who persecuted Lazarus. And the rich man died. And Lazarus was in the bosom of Abraham. And the rich man said, hey, hey, Laz. Could you come down and, and put a drop of water on my parched tongue? Abraham wouldn't even let Lazarus speak. He said, uh, there's a gulf between you and him, and he can't come to put no water on your tongue. Now the rabbi knows the parable. He had some brothers. He said, well, could you, see, could you let him go to my five brothers and give them some water? Because evidently the whole family was catching hell. And Abraham said, no, he can't come to your brother or your brothers. I said, you know, uh, Rabbi, are you telling me that if I came from God with a message for you, that you would reject me because of my color? And the wisdom that is in my mouth is for your salvation? Would you do that, Rabbi? Now, he don't know where I'm going, and at the time, I didn't either. <clears throat> but now, let's look at it. Did you know that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, when you come, into the full understanding of Jesus, you will awaken at once. Are you asleep? Yes, you are. You have a, a degree or two of consciousness, but don't get it twisted. See, God don't sleep all day. God don't lay in the bed looking at TV, hoping that something's going to come and change his condition. You understand what I'm saying? The rabbi would not accept wisdom from me to correct his people because of the color of my skin. Now, the name of this subject is Jesus is the key. It was a long time getting to it, but I had to lay the right base. Now look at this. Muslims and Christians argue. There may be some Christian scholars in this house, and I would like to engage you for a moment. This is not vanity, nothing. I just want to talk to you about Jesus. You say, wow, if we knew the history of Jesus, the truth of him, we would awaken at once. What is there about 
the knowledge of Jesus that is hidden from us. That if we knew it, we'd be up and moving. Could it be that that's why Jesus said, you shall know what? And what would truth do? Are you free? Well, then you don't know. So the Bible, Paul talking, how can they know except they have a teacher? How can they have a teacher except he be sent? White folk ain't sending you no teacher to free you from their grip. God has to send one for you. Did you know that some of the Jews in Israel called Jesus a monkey? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many of you have ever heard that they refer to Jesus as that monkey? That means y'all got some studying to do. Look at this. They wrote on the church in Palestine or in Israel, Jesus is a monkey. And when white folk want to tease you, they call you a monkey. Jesus had a hard time among them. Listen to these words. When Jesus, these are words from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. When Jesus came into his mission, he was the last prophet to the Jews. But he was born in Palestine and fled to Egypt where his mother was born. He was a melanin colored human, kinky hair, and they didn't like him. The same spirit that that rabbi came to me. How dare you think you can come and teach us? That's the way they felt about Jesus, who was their last prophet. Now, Muslims believe Jesus was only a prophet. Christians believe Jesus of 2,000 years ago was in fact the Messiah. So on those two points, Son of God, all of that kind of talk, Muslims and Christians disagree. God has come to clear up the differences and help us to understand why we are really one. I'm going to say it again. Why we are really one. Jesus of 2,000 years ago was only a prophet. And when he thought that he was going to be the one to destroy 
the civilization of those to whom he was sent and found out they had 2,000 more years on our planet. He was, as Paul said, a man born out of due season. So Jesus, my brother, knew he was 2,000 years too soon. Yes, sir. Jesus came to remind the Jews to cleanse themselves from their deviation from the law given by Moses yes, and the Israelite prophets yes, to them. Jesus warned them that if they did not cleanse, if they did not come back to the law of God given to them through Moses and the Israelite prophets, then 2,000 years in the future they would meet their end. Now, Jesus, when he found out he was 2,000 years too soon, and when he knew he was only a sign of that one that would come at the end of the rule of this world, he decided Listen to the words. He decided to give his life for the truth that he taught. There he was in Palestine. He never taught the multitudes. There were no multitudes in Palestine living, listening to Jesus. In fact, on the day he decided to die for the truth that he taught, he had his largest crowd. 3,500, 35 people, pardon me. Jesus didn't run from the enemy. He offered his life, yes, sir. not to the enemy, but he offered his life for the truth that he taught from God. And he goes out on the streets of Jerusalem to die, and he found a crowd gathered under the awning of an old a Jewish man's store and he started teaching them and they were listening. The owner of the store came out and Jesus quieted them down by saying, I'll, I'll get them to buy something. And the owner of the store went back in and Jesus started teaching. I'm going to depart for a moment to tell you about the mind of a prophet of God. How can you do that? Because I'm one of them. hanging out with Elijah. A prophet becomes a low line of what he brings his students to. Prophets do not come to the people to whom they were missioned with the thought in mind I hate them 
and I hope they won't listen so that the God will kill them. See, if a prophet hates the one that he comes to teach and warn, he's, he's weak as a teacher and does not represent the mercy of God in his prophetic mission and message. Jesus had compassion for the Jews. How do you know that, Farrakhan? Because I've never been a hater. Of the Jewish people. In all my conversations with them, the level of conversation is at the highest level. Yes, sir. I never raise my voice. Right. There's compassion in my voice. Yes, sir. One of the rabbis that were in the group with having dinner with me, he said, Farrakhan, no, Rabbi Ma, uh, uh, Rabbi uh, Oh, God. What? Somebody called out a name. No, the one that I mentioned earlier, Shalman. Rabbi Shalman was a brilliant rabbi. But his scriptural power was weak when it comes to knowing the prophecies concerning his people. The rabbis wanted me to bow to them. I mean, th just think about this. They gave me a set of principles that they wanted me to live up to. And they would clean up my image. If you know the art of the deal, you don't deal with Satan. You don't give him an inch. Because any compromise with Satan is compromising your own victory over Satan. Listen, listen. One of the Jewish men said, Rabbi Shalman first, would you come before the board of rabbis? I said, tomorrow, if you could arrange it. Another rabbi said, would you come to the synagogue? I said, tonight if you could arrange it. And Rabbi Shalman said, wait, 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 slow, slow down. I'm telling you the truth. I invited the rabbis to come here, stand in this pulpit, and talk to those who are with me. He said, well, I, I, I can't uh, do that. Uh, it would send the wrong signal. Because I wanted them to see you listening to me 
that I've never taught one of you in private or in the public to do harm to nobody. So when I said I was anxious to come to the synagogue and to talk to the board of rabbis, they closed that down right away. I said, well, why don't you come to the mosque yes, sir. and you can speak to those who follow me. See if you can feel hatred coming out of them as you try to teach. See, I never taught none of you to hate Jews. If you hate them, you hate them on your own, not because I taught you. Now, look at this. They didn't want to send the wrong signal so they wouldn't come to the mosque. I said, I'll tell you what. You've never met my wife. You've never met my children. Why don't you come again to my home? And you can meet my wife. You can meet my children. See if you can sense any hatred. You're intelligent men. I'm talking to the rabbis. I said, sit with me and my family. And I won't say a word. You can talk to them. I had the utmost confidence that my family would re respect their presence because we're civilized people, man. I said, you're sensitive. You know when people hate. You can feel it. Do you know the, um, the musicians called Coldplay? How many of you have heard Coldplay? Raise your hands. Oh, yeah, you all know. The leader of Coldplay is Chris Martin. He came to my home. He wanted to hear me play the violin. You don't come to my home and I'm entertaining you. When you come into my home, it's like coming to God in the mosque. You come to be taught. Look, Chris Martin flew on his own jet, or he had his own plane, and he brought a few Jewish friends of his. Now they're going to sco scope me out. Sitting in my living room, asking me questions. See, when you ask me a question, I immediately consult the God. Wait, wait, wait. You ask me a question? I'm listening. By the time you finish the question, God has given me the answer. But He's also let me know your motive for asking the question. So I can answer your question and address your motive. Ask any of them that come to me and ask me. Now what I'm trying to tell you is, Elijah Muhammad prepared a young man 
to become God enough to challenge Satan and defeat him. There's another Jesus, not the historical Jesus, but the prophetic Jesus. Seventy-five percent of what you read in the New Testament, the Gospels, are not of Jesus the prophet, but of Jesus who was prophesied to come, the Messiah. Well, that man, 2,000 years ago, his largest crowd was 35 people. But the Jesus you read about spoke to the multitudes. J. Edgar Hoover, like Herod and the rest of the demons, knew who they were looking for. And they were looking for a black Messiah who could unite our people, especially the nationalist community. A lot of people speak to multitudes. But the message that they speak is, sorry, it's not messianic. See, Jesus knew nothing of what you call Christianity. He never preached Christianity. My teacher taught me that Jesus' teaching was freedom, justice, and equality. Which is what we teach today. Could it be that the Jesus you're looking for is hiding in plain sight? Could it be? Now look. Look, brothers and sisters, if I spoke this 40 years ago, well, I couldn't speak it 40 years ago because I didn't know. I knew enough to get started. And uh, when I say get started, meaning on this journey, now look at this. Well, he taught me of Moses, he taught me of Aaron, he taught me of Elijah, he taught me of Elisha, he taught me of Abraham, he taught me of all these great ones. And then he said, like David, in the 40th Psalm, I think it is, it reads, and lo, I come in the volume of the book. 
of the book. I'm not on a page. I'm in the whole volume of the book. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Calm yourself down. Now, we're about to get up in the stratosphere, baby. David was the prototype of the Jesus, the Messiah. David, the son of Jesse. Out in the field, teaching the sheep. First time Elijah Muhammad laid eyes on me physically in his presence. He came over to me after dinner and he said, Brother, you remind me of David. Yeah. Study David. Messenger said to me, he taught me about Moses, he taught me about Aaron, he taught me about Jesus, only a prophet. And then one day, he said, brother, when you find out who you are, you're going to have to struggle to hold yourself down. He knew all along who his student was. So he was gently guiding me to the reality of who I really am. And none of you will be successful in teaching until you know and preach who I am. Elijah Muhammad made me the representative of his message on radio for six years. And one day, he called me on the telephone. And he said, brother, I want you to speak on the subject upon this man will I lay the key. I said, yes, sir. And I preached the subject and sent it to him. He listened. He said, oh, he said, no, you missed. Um, try it again. Second time he listened, he said, no, you missed again. Try it one more time. On the third time, I thought I was getting close. He said, you missed it again. He said, but go on to the next subject. See, you can't give a man something to eat if on that point he ain't hungry. Oh, 
He was trying to get me to see something and I missed it every time. And one day, last year, I came to the National House and uh, Brother Fontaine, uh, Brother Abdul Rasul was in the um, meeting room where we have our um, cabinet meetings and whatnot. And he said, Brother, I found the tape that you made at Emory University in Georgia. They got a lot of your tapes. He said, but I got this one. And when I looked at it, I had been saying the title wrong. Throwing myself off because it wasn't time. See, what you gotta understand with God, and when he's making a man, he's got to be on time when he learns. Not before time. On time. The real subject was, on this man will I lay the key? But I was saying, the subject was, on this man have I laid the key? And show you how one word messing up the tense of the verb can throw you completely off. And that's why you're messed up over Jesus because you're looking past. And Jesus is walking in present time. Bear with me a few more minutes. Uh, that's right, brother. Just relax, man. You are at home, brother. It's your house. But listen to this. Now remember, I don't know who I am. This, he told me to, I remind him of David. Okay, once I got the tense right, those of you who study English, you're not speaking correctly unless you have verb and subject agreement. In other words, you can't be in the present with an action that ties you to the past. You got to come all the way up into present time in order to be successful at what you do if what you do is supposed to be done in present time. Check this out. Once I got the tense right, he tells me the subject. I want you to teach this. Upon this man, this man is the man he's talking. Will I lay the key? That's big. Now, he's about to give me some keys. Yeah. But evidently, I wasn't ready to receive them. Now, you read the Psalms, and you read David, and you read the kind of key that God gave David. See, the key to the house of David 
was given to Jesus. On this man will sometime in the future. And what he opens, no man can close. And what he closes, no man can open. Now, I could read that all day long. It wouldn't mean nothing to me. Because I don't know David and I'm learning about Jesus. And so, yeah, okay, you're going to lock people out. Now, put that constellation of stars up that you had up last week with my teacher and me in the center of the prophetic community. You see it? Hey. Those are the worthies of God. But look who's in the center. Look who is in the center. It's not one man. It's two men who act as one. <laughs> See, my father, I don't know, you got to keep that picture up. Oh, it's over there? Thank you. Keep it on the big screen. They know what I look like. Look at this. See, my teacher said these words during the Theology of Time lecture series in 1972, right here where I'm standing. He said, you all don't know what the fulfiller looks like. Fulfiller of what? The prophecies of all of the former prophets. What he was telling you is he, Elijah Muhammad, fulfills the prophetic utterances of the former prophets and his life touches their life. His mission encompasses their mission and ends the time of prophets because now you're coming into the time of the presence of God and God making you, me, us into God's. Listen, listen, listen. You got it up there? Now, Elijah Muhammad, this is his helper by his side, made for him by the one that's not there for you to see, but his name is Master Fard Muhammad. Jesus is the key. Once you have the key, you can open doors that may have been shut to you and you can close doors. Now, Jesus closes the door on prophethood. Not Jesus the prophet. Jesus the Messiah. He's not yesterday. 
He's today. He was a man of color yesterday. They rejected him and called him a monkey. And the Jews went astray. See, Moses' law was broken 1,700 years after Moses. A wicked fellow named Nimrod broke the civilization of Moses. And the whole earth went into darkness, spiritual darkness. And Jesus was born in that darkness, out of that darkness. And he was telling the Jewish people, you've got to go back to what Moses and the Israelite prophets taught you. And if you clean yourself up, God will not destroy you. They hated him. And they sought to kill him. And the Jews and the Roman soldiers, they got him. On that street that Saturday morning, between 9 and 10 o'clock, Jesus was teaching. The Jewish store owner realized that this was the one that there was a uh, bounty on him. He called the authorities. And when the authorities came and they saw Jesus, they ran to get him and bring him to the authorities. And they started arguing among themselves, the two soldiers, because one said that he got there sooner than the man on the left. And listen to how sharp the mind of Jesus was. He said, the soldier on my left you did not get me first. The man on the right was three-tenths of a second ahead of you. That soldier walked away. And the Roman soldier that was bringing Jesus to the authorities started bargaining with him. You brought him in dead you get $1,500. If you bring him in alive, you get $2,500. But dead or alive, they wanted Jesus. And the Roman soldier said, look, if they get you, they're going to torture you. So why don't you let me kill you? It'll be so quick, you would not feel it. I'm a poor man and the $2,500 I could use. And Jesus said to the soldier, come and do it. And he faced the soldier with his arms outstretched in the form of a cross. But the Roman soldier took a knife that looked like the American hunting knife. And he drove that knife into the heart of Jesus with such speed and force that it came through him and stuck on the board behind him. 
his nerves froze. And when Joseph came to retrieve the body, he was in this form. And they laid him down. The reason I love Jesus so much and of all the subjects and histories that the messenger taught me I taught the history of Jesus the best of all the histories not knowing not knowing that I was teaching about myself don't clap, don't clap. Just sit, listen, think. Nobody in America, in the world, has attracted the anger of the Jewish people more than who? I don't want you to be afraid to say it. See, it is I. I've never hurt one Jewish person in my life. I've never told any one of you to harm one of them. My mother grew up, or grew when I was growing up, working at her sewing machine and cleaning the homes of Jewish people. My mother never came home and told me one negative thing <clears throat> about the Jewish people that she worked for. One day she was in the kitchen watching pots and I came on the radio in Boston and the Jewish lady for whom she worked looked and listened. And she said, I wonder who that boy's mother is. And she looked up from the pot. My beautiful black mother And she said, that's my son. I don't think she stayed working there too much longer. Because <clears throat> in order for a son to know what I was teaching with the boldness that I was teaching it with, I had to have a strong mother. Now, those of you who have Bibles, go home. And in the eighth chapter of John, there's a controversy between Jesus and members of the Jewish community. And Jesus said to the Jews, I know you. You are not the children of Abraham. For if you were the children of Abraham, you would do the works of Abraham. And you would love me. For I came from God. And now you hate me. A man that has told you the truth. You seek to kill me. 
a man that has told you the truth. Some of us are like those Jews that hated Jesus without a cause. So when I was in that little chapel on the day that my brother Kobe was pronounced dead, when I finished my prayer and looked up into the eyes of Jesus, a black man on a cross, his eyes were like not fear, but he was deeply concerned about what he was looking at. And when I saw it, I exclaimed, Father, you know that I now know I'm looking at myself. How deep, how deep is your love? How deep is your love? See, Jesus loved his people. And the first thing I said to God when I learned that he had come and chosen a messenger, I said, Lord, why, why didn't you choose me? You know that I love my people. And then I thought, oh, well, I wasn't even born when the Savior came. And I said, let me go and find him and offer him my life. And I went and found Elijah Muhammad, at that time known as the messenger of God. Put it back up on the screen. I offered him my life and I stayed in the class. When I was 12 years in rebuilding the nation, I met the head of the Rabita, the Muslim World League in Mecca. He came to Chicago and he wanted to introduce me to 150 imams. I said, I would like that, but I would like to come to Mecca and meet with the scholars. I'm not thinking that I'm fulfilling scripture. Because when Jesus was 12 years old, he, he confounded the scholars. He arranged for me to come to Mecca, sent for me, paid my way. And there was nothing they could do with the words of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad his invincible truth. So they agreed to let me be, but they didn't bow down. But they could not defeat my arguments. You got them prophets up, put them up. The prophets, brother, thank you. Yeah. 
Do you know it's written in the scripture about Solomon who was the wisest of all of the old prophets and the scripture says Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed as the least of those who follow Jesus. Solomon could not answer the questions in your student enrollment. All of it is talking about us. You stay with me a few minutes and your eyes come open. Things that you didn't know, you begin to find out because I represent Jesus. And some say, well, you called him the exalted Christ. How is he that? There's a scripture in the Bible that says that Jesus fasted for 40 days in the wilderness. And my teacher asked me, do you know what that means? Every time he asked me, did I know what this means or that? I said, no, sir, I don't know. See, stop faking it. If you don't know, shut up. Because the more you try to fake it to make yourself look wise, you make yourself look like just what you are, a foolish person. So I told my teacher, no, I, I, I don't know what that means. He says it means that Jesus was not permitted to make a convert to himself in 40 years. The man was among us. We called him Elijah Muhammad, brother minister, Dear Holy Apostle, but we didn't know who he really was. As the time got more and more for him to go, I started coming up into the knowledge of him. It frightened me, and I wrote him a letter telling him the things that he was teaching me that were heavy with the hint of who he really was, and I put it all together and threw it on the plate. Am I a believer in you in a new relate, uh, reality? He said, brother, that note that you thought you sent me was the biggest letter that I ever received from you. The big Jesus. The son of man that came out of the east even unto the west. In the 24th chapter of Matthew. That's Master Farad Muhammad. Listen. He came to North America by himself and he raised Elijah Muhammad. And for 43 years, Elijah Muhammad taught us. But he never told us who he was. But before he left us, he said, brother, don't worry about where you are in the scriptures. 
you make my great commission known and I will represent you to the people. His great commission while he was among us, he was in fact the Messiah. Oh, let's look at it now. See? He was taught, not it revealed. He was taught the book, the wisdom, the Torah, the gospel. He will teach us what foods to eat, what foods to store in our houses. He taught us how to eat to live. You look at the Muslims who are disciplining their eating habits. Their skin glows, their eyes are bright. And we're putting years on our lives. That's what the Messiah would do. Now, let's look at this book of these prophets. See Abraham over there? Yes, sir. What did he do? He introduced the oneness of God. He obeyed certain commands that the God gave him. And when he had fulfilled them, God told him, I'm going to make of you a great leader of men. Mm -hmm. You read the Bible, it says that Abraham's followers, his seed, would be numbered like the stars and like the sands of the sea. And then Jesus comes and he says, before Abraham was, I am. Elijah Muhammad taught me in such a way that I know I existed before Abraham. We existed before there was a prophet named Abraham. Look at these prophets. Poor Noah. Is he up there? Noah taught some people in the Middle East. And he preached for 150 years while he was building a ship that was on sand. He was lied on, he was laughed at, he was mocked. Did you hear me tell you how I said things and I was laughed at and mocked? But I never bent. The followers of Noah were of the meanest of the people. They were the lowest rank of the people. So some of those who had letters said they didn't want to follow Noah because of all of the riffraff that had accepted Noah. But the Bible said as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. Said the people, every imagination of their hearts was continually to do evil. That's the way you are right now. You love a party. And when the end came, the people were partying. They were having a good time when the water came down. Now, that just was a little small thing back there. The whole earth was not flooded, just the people. Oh, 
when we talked to the scholars in Mecca, we told them, man, if Noah came back here, he'd run. He, he said, God, please, don't leave me in America with these foul people. I need more juice. Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Look, look, look. Lot dealt with the first manifestation of homosexuality. In a tiny little city. Sodom and Gomorrah. If Lot came back, come on, let's deal with it. These prophets are children compared to what we're dealing with today. So, we are the sum total of all of this and then some. When Jesus gave his sermon on the mount, he said, blessed are you when men shall revile you persecute you say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake then Jesus said rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven so did they the prophets you are in a prophetic community. And you can't think now because somebody went in front of you and was evil spoken of it, you're not going to be. The moment you tell your family, I, I went to the Mars, that's when you're being evil spoken of right from Jump Street. Can you hang? How deep is your love? Moses' work was small. He only led, uh, according to some of the scholars, about 400,000 people. We got that many sick people in a small city in America. Moses spoke to Pharaoh. The Pharaoh of yesterday is nothing compared to the Pharaoh of today. Mr. Trump is the Pharaoh of today. And, oh, you're caught between a rock and a hard place. You don't, you don't know where to place your bed. We place ours with God. Now, I think if you look at all those great stars, the prophets of God, they don't equal one Elijah. All of them put together. I'm in the family of Elijah Muhammad. He's fathering me and you through me into great wisdom. Are you willing to suffer? 
for the establishment of the truth? A lot of those disciples said a lot of stuff. You can make your mouth say anything. But when the deal went down, how deep is your love? I, like my brother before me, have come out to die. Not to die stupid, to challenge Satan. My teacher reminded me of Job. God and Satan were having a talk, man. And Satan told God, When God asked him, hey, when's coming thou? He said, hey, I've been walking up and down to and fro in the earth. I did my job. I ate up all your people. And God asked him, have you considered my servant Job? That's the price we have to pay to set our people free. Free from the grip of Satan. So God asked him, did you consider Job? He said, yeah. We tried to kill him a few times. I stand before you almost like a dead man because of what they've done to me. I have very few internal organs that are still there because he put so much radiation in me it ate up my insides. But look at me. Listen to me. I have lived in so much pain that I couldn't sit down like normal people do because it ate up the rectum. It ate up. Oh, man. I mean, I'm not trying to Get no praise to hell no. We just give all the thanks and the praise to God. I'm saying this. Ask my wife and my children the pain that I lived with for years. Years. Where there's not a pain medicine that the devil made that I haven't been guilty of using because I was in so much pain. Davacet, Percocet, Oxycontin, um, fentanyl, the worst painkillers you can imagine. I functioned with all of that going on. I never preached to you high. I just preach to you in pain. Never miss the beat. And when the devil looks at me wondering why I'm not dead, it's because God has put a hedge around me. But Satan said to God, if you remove that head, I'll make him curse you to your face. So God told uh, Satan, 
I remove the hedge. Do with him what you feel you want to do. Only you can't take his life. And one man stood between God and Satan for the liberation of the people. See, you love Jesus and you have every right to love him. And the reason you love him so is because he died. So called for our sins. You never met that Jesus. See, Elijah Muhammad told me and us that two thirds of the Holy Quran was for him. And one third is for some other fellow, and I'm going to let him worry about his part. Elijah Muhammad fulfilled his two thirds. I am willing to fulfill mine. Stop. He said, through you, I'll get all my people. How? How would that happen? You got to lay it all down. This is one man he can't break. But he's going to try. And if I pass the test, I fulfilled the scriptures. He was bruised for our iniquities. That didn't happen back then. It happens every day of my life up here. But the cross was meant for me. And I am meant for that cross. But the scriptures or the song says, must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? Sorry about that. There's a cross for you. And there's a cross for me. One day soon, it's the will of Allah. And it is. Jesus was God's man. He was like, like a son of God. And he loved his son so much that he offered him. That's why I said last week, I'm not running from you white folks. I know I got to pay a price for my courage to speak the truth. But death is sweet if it leads to your redemption. They won't kill more than 300 of us. So says the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. If I don't want to make you sad, because my death is a glorious thing, because God is not going to let him do it all. I mean, it's going it's to look pretty bad. But damn, on that third day, boy. Somebody got to live it in front of you so that you can know it's real. That's the price for the redemption of our people. Now, thank you. I love you too, and I'm proving it. He
when I used to talk to Michael Jackson, and I would say, Mike, I love you. He said, I love you more. <laughs> and some of you say that to me. I, I tell you, stop it. Because you can't love me more than I love you. Because I am the one that is going to pay the price for your redemption. So, I close, brothers and sisters. I hadn't even recovered from last week. I probably needed another week to just rest. But I wanted to come out and see you. But now it's on you. Don't say that they can't arrest the minister. He's too powerful. No, they will arrest me. They arrested my father before me. They're wondering why I'm not dead right now because they they put some powerful radiation in me. And they knew I wasn't going to survive, but... <laughs> they said, why don't the nigga die? May Allah bless you. May Allah bless you to be strong yes, sir. in faith. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. May Allah bless you to hold on yes, to that invincible truth yes, that is the foundation of your faith. Yes, sir. Now the foolish woman will Take the yarn that she has spun strongly. Right, right. And uh, I want to, if you want to know what the yarn is, you know, sometimes when the, you talk a lot, they compare it to yarn. Because most of us spin a trap with our mouths. So when the minister goes to his father, you come back and they'll teach you about it. All you got to do is keep breathing. Because you're going to see it. You'll remember. Elijah Muhammad, he is our great Jesus. He worked with us for 40 years. He escaped death. Pick up your Quran and read it for yourself. He was made to appear as such. But they did not kill him for certain. So when I went to the wheel and came back with a message, they knew then when I could expose what they were planning in secret that somebody told me something. about Kobe. Kobe is a star. And God took him in the way he took him. 
so that we could focus on him. God took Jesus in the way he took Jesus so that the world could focus on him. Kobe died at 41. But when his light was put out by the evil accident of time, the star died, but the light is still traveling through space and time. When you look at the stars at night, many of those stars have died a long time ago. So many light years away, and the light is still traveling. And you and I could look up and see the light of a star that's gone. You can look up now and see the light of Abraham. You can see the light of Moses and Aaron. You can see the light of Jesus the prophet. You can see the light of Muhammad. Their light is still traveling through space and time. And Kobe's light will go on touching young people because God made Kobe and Gianna and the people that died with him, they found a degree of immortality. Some people live and die and you never hear about them anymore. The Muslims in New Zealand that the white boy went and killed them in the mosque. And those that he killed in the mosque were those who were there early waiting to say their prayers. And some were on their way to the mosque because they were light, late. And he is there thinking, Phew, I'm so glad I, I was late today. Yeah, you're late, and when you are the late, who the hell going to remember you? But those that were in the mosque on time, and they met the enemy, and they met death, But whenever that tragedy is mentioned, we got to mention those who lost their lives. God gives life. He takes life. Kobe is more alive now than he was when he was alive. God wanted you to study not just the passion he had for basketball, for which he won an Oscar, but God wants you to study his passion for life and the business of life. So while you still have your wings and you can jump and play ball, the last time Kobe played, he said, uh, I can't do it. My legs are gone, man. And his wife, Vanessa, put before him all of the great ones that had retired. And when he looked at them, he said, I can do it. One more time. And he went out that night and scored 60 points and walked away. I know that this was my last Savior's Day for a while. 
and I didn't finish and I guess now so much more to be said but I came back today to this house which is our house to tell you don't you let yourself be the woman that loses your faith and you pull the yarn of your life and end up as nothing. Don't you labor us. Get it twisted. Because you can lose all you think you got if you lose your faith. Satan is tugging now, especially at the council. You think they're going to govern the nation? Don't leave one bit of your faith messed up because you will unravel. Keep your yarn tight. Yes, sir. Keep your faith right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And wherever I am, you'll know yes, sir. Yes, sir. I ain't dead. Yes, sir. I will die, but not now. I will die, but not now. I got more work to do. I got to go get a book for you. So you stay strong. You stay together. Every black leader that we lost, his closing words were always the unity of all of us is going to protect us as we go through the fire. Yes, Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. All praise is due to Allah for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Come on, brothers and sisters. Come on, brothers and sisters. Let us express our deep appreciation, our gratitude, and our love for the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. All praise is due to Allah. For our beloved brother and minister, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan.